Let's talk more about this. I'm joined now by Jason Evans, who's the founder of Factor 8, the independent haemophilia group. Lost his father in 1993 after being infected with both hepatitis C and HIV from contaminated Factor 8 products. And I'm also joined by Gillian Fife. She's in Edinburgh and was contaminated with uh, hepatitis C after giving birth to her daughter in 1988. Uh, and is giving evidence to the inquiry. Perhaps I can start with you because uh, you were a 29-year-old teacher, I think. You, you went in to give birth, and then what happened? Um, um, before I answer that question, apologies for the hat. The television lights are too strong for uh, my autoimmune condition, which is a consequence of the treatment I received. Um, but what happened, uh, to answer your question now, what happened was that I was given a blood transfusion after the birth of my daughter, I asked that I would only be given it if it was given as an emergency. I, I was assured it, I needed it and then it was delayed unaccountably. So I now don't think I had to have that blood transfusion. Anyway, seven years later, I received a letter telling me it had been contaminated with the hepatitis C virus. And it took another um, over four years, including two treatments with alpha interferon, which uh, with which I injected myself every second day, first time for six months, and that treatment failed, and then again for a year in combination with another drug before I was cured. However, the cure has left me with autoimmune disease, which means I can't G go in normal light levels. Jill, I want to come back to you in just a moment, but I'm, I'm just going to go to Jason for a moment, because uh, these stories, which we've all heard over recent uh, weeks, uh, all of them devastating on a personal level, but what are you hoping that this inquiry will achieve? What, what will it mean for you having lost your father? Well, I, th I think this inquiry has been a long, long time in the making. I think for me personally and everyone impacted by this, it hopefully will bring some form of closure. You know, we've been quite clear since the beginning of the Factor 8 campaign that what we want to do is to put the truth on record. And that quote you had at the beginning of the segment here that Penrose concluded that little could or should have been done differently. We want to change that and uh, turn that into there was a hell of a lot that could and should have been done differently. Do you, what is driving this? Is, is it frustration, anger, what? I think it's the fact that people have lost people close to them. You know, my father's dead, many other people's fathers are dead, people have lost their husbands, their children, um, people are seriously ill, those who still survive. And they've never had the full truth about what has happened to them put on the record. We've never had it known that the then subsidiary companies of Bayer, Baxter and Revlon Healthcare, these pharmaceutical companies supplied products which killed a generation of haemophiliacs and left many others uh, seriously ill. They want that acknowledged and where negligence is found, uh, obviously compensation comes with that. But the real important thing right at the forefront of this is getting the truth on record about the largest loss of life incident that's happened in modern Britain. Jill, if I can come back to you, we were talking about how you, you, you gave birth, you're 29 years old, you're a teacher, and then, then you were aware that, that you weren't feeling great. Just describe how you became aware that, that, that something had happened. Well, I, um, for the next seven years, we, we put the whole incident behind us, and for the next seven years, I was always exhausted and always very cold. But because of my nature, um, I wanted to do well and I felt ashamed that I wasn't coping. So uh, the more difficult, the, the less I was able to cope, the more I felt ashamed and uh, uh, just kept trying to do harder, uh, to, to work harder. And then seven years later, a letter arrived to the post saying that the blood donation had been infected with the hepatitis C virus and I knew immediately that I was infected. You, I think, uh felt that you, you wanted to do some research on your own. What yes. did you discover and how did you react when you found out that, well, you weren't alone? No, and that was one of the, um, one of the things that uh, I think is uh, most wrong about all that has happened. Um, when I, uh, eventually I, I uh, had to resign from my teaching post after I was cured because of this side effect. So I wrote a book 
and the publisher said you need to do some research to put it in context. So I went to the British Library newspaper archive day after day after day and discovered from newspaper cuttings in all the national newspapers that in fact thousands of people had been infected, that there had been numerous attempts um, to um, have some sort of inquiry or there had been inquiries which had not actually been uh, useful. And, um, and one of the things that I think was m most wrong was that nobody ever told us that. We, I found out researching for a book. This inquiry, uh, which is happening this week in Edinburgh, um, is completely different. It is so unlike anything that's ever happened before that we can't, be my family and I can hardly believe it. It's in one, in it's what wonderful. way, Jill? What, what, what is, in what way is it different? Well, Sir Brian and his team have made enormous efforts to uh, talk to people like me, to all the people that this happened to, to listen to their stories and to properly assess the full impact of what has happened. And um, I think they've had about two and a half thousand statements. Um, lots and lots of people are being invited to give evidence, uh, a cross-section representing everyone uh, who has suffered and all the families who have suffered. And uh, so it is only now that um, a proper assessment is being made of the full impact of uh, the contaminated blood disaster. The effect that's had already I, is transforming. Um, for the first time we feel that we are, there is some official uh, recognition of uh, what has happened to us that, that when we talk to people about it they will understand. And I, I can see from your smile that there's something you've never had I suspect which is hope. Yes, that is true. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm against sure that... all expectation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Jason, if I can pick up on that, I mean, you, you, are you, do you share that confidence that actually you might be on the edge of finding out what went wrong, why it went wrong, and where, if blame is to be apportioned somewhere, where it goes? Yes. Well, I, th I think Jill's right. There has never been anything like this before. Of course, the. Um, previous inquiry you had there in uh, Scotland, the Penrose inquiry was limited by the fact uh, of its terms of reference. They were very short. It wasn't in there, for instance, to look at pharmaceutical companies. The inquiry couldn't compel uh, people from outside of Scotland, which bear in mind this happened pre-devolution under Westminster. And so, of course, what happened when the Penrose inquiry, the previous inquiry, tried to compel civil servants, for instance, from outside of Scotland is, is, is it couldn't. For example, I have a document in front of me here on the screen, freely available on the Penrose website, and it's a reply from a civil servant, Diana Walford at the Department of Health, who isn't here to defend herself, but this is what her reply said when she was asked to give evidence. She said, there is no obligation upon former Department of Health officials to provide a statement, and after careful consideration, I respectfully decline to do so. That will not be able to happen in this inquiry because this inquiry can compel witnesses throughout the UK, whether that's civil servants like Diana Walford or whether that's politicians, pharmaceutical company executives. So there's a lot more power here. And obviously that's why I think everyone, uh, not just myself and Jill, are confident that this inquiry has got the teeth to get to the truth. Jason, Jason Evans, founder of Factor 8. Good to talk to you. And Jill, I hope that hope turns into, well, happiness probably overstates it, but at least some sort of closure uh, to this period of your life. I, I thank you both for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much.